on, I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, the work of Alan Turing as it relates to computing and a little bit to philosophy again. So this evening, um, I'm going to talk about two important questions that he posed. The question of what is computation and then the question of what is intelligence or phrased differently, can machines think? And also mention a thesis that he came up with about com computing machinery. So um, this is a sketch of Alan Turing done by um, the system called ACON1, which is a system developed at Goldsmiths to in examine how artists sketch. And this was produced not by taking a photo image and photoshopping it, but by pro uh, sending signals to a robotic arm attached to a pen um, that actually drew this, this sketch. Um, that's Alan Turing. This year is the um, centenary of his birth, and there's a, there have been a lot of events around the UK celebrating the work he's done and bringing uh, to the public more about his life. Um, his life was a, sh was a short one. Um, as you can see, he died in his 40s. Towards the end of his life, he was actually persecuted quite a lot. He was persecuted by the British government because he was gay. Um, and he, he ended up, he, he died through poisoning. And it is unknown whether the poisoning was accidental or suicide. But he was, he was basically criminalized for being gay. Um, and we, sorry, we lost a really important scientist through this. Um, so I do want to talk about the positive aspects of his work today. He's credited with being the father of artificial intelligence and has been described as one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. So the first question is that he asked was um, ab about what would a computer, something that did computing, do? How would computation actually work? Now, this was in the years before the war, before the Second World War, and there were no actual computing machines. There were no computers at that stage. There were devices that did various kinds of things like adding um, and engines to do addition, but no general computers. And Turing was very interested in this. And he actually devised a theoretical machine that was able to perform com computation. Um, and he, it had these things. It had a tape in one dimension of infinite length that it could read and write to and a head that did the reading. It could read a symbol on the tape and write a symbol to the tape. And the head could move left and right. It had a table of instructions, and it had a set of possible states that it could be in. And with this, Turing was able to describe ways to do computation. Um, so here is a, a visual example of what a Turing machine might look like. Here's a tape. It's got symbols on it. Zeros and ones and Bs. It could contain any symbols. Embodied in where the tape head is is also the state that the machine is in. And this machine has, say, two states, Q1 and Q2. At the moment, the state it's in is Q2. And it's got the, the set of instructions. Each instruction contains five things. Five tuple, the current state, the input, the output, the direction the head should move, and the next state it goes into. So what this says is, if the machine is in state Q1 and the input is zero, which is what we've got here, it needs to output a zero, move to the right, and remain in state Q1. And these other... Um, Tuples are other parts of the program. Another example, another Turing machine, again a visual one. A, B, and HALT are states. And here are some of the tuples. This one would, in order to be completely described, have four tuples. We've only got three. I left one out so that you could think about what that last tuple might be. 
Each tuple describes one of these transitions in the diagram. This is equivalent to the Turing machine. Well, in, in, in concept to the Turing machine you saw on the previous page. It's not the same Turing machine. So what's the missing transition? We've got the one where we're in state A and we go from 1. Oh, sorry, our, and our input is 1. We've got the one where we're in state A and our input is 0. We've got the one where we're in state B and our input is 1. This is the one we're missing. And you should be able to construct what it would be. It would be B1, sorry, B0, 1, left, and A is the next state. And what Turing worked out was that with these, you could write sets of instructions that could do absolutely anything that was computable. And that remains true to this day. You can, with a Turing machine, make a machine that can do anything that any computer can do. So the, com the computer that you have on your cell phone could be written into a set of those and the states. It would be massive. The number of these tuples would be enormous. The number of states would be enormous. But the theoretical possibility is still valid. I've got an example Turing machine that I want to take you to, just because it's interesting. This is a Turing machine simulator that um, has been written by um, someone else. And this part here is the, the tuples. They're written in a slightly different format, but each of them have the five, um, five components. Let's get rid of that. And I want to actually pull up a different one which is easier to, so there are some pre-programmed Turing machines. And I want to show you the one that does binary addition. I'm going to load that one in. So this, these are the tuples that do binary addition. And I'm going to add two very simple numbers. I'm going to add 0, 1, 1, well, let's add 1, 1, and 1, 1. 1, 1 represents 3 in binary. The other 1, 1 represents 3 in binary. Going to reset it. So this is where the Turing machine starts, and that's where the head is, and that's the current state, according to the program that was below. And uh, if we run it, this is what it does. And it terminates with the output 110, which is 6 in binary. Um, and you saw it step through. We could step through it, and you will see the states that it uh, runs through current state is 1, and it, it variously works through the program that is in, in here. Now, that is one Turing machine that does one thing. You can write a Turing machine to do, as I said, absolutely anything that is computable. And so this is the thesis that Turing worked on with uh, a mathematician called Alonzo Church. Um, and it has not been disproved. He asked the question of whether it was possible to make a Turing machine perform anything that is computable. And there has been no, up until now, there has been no refutation of this thesis. Um, he also came up with the idea of the universal Turing machine, which was a Turing machine that took as its input tape a Turing machine. And that is a, our general purpose computer. The computer takes as its input a program. The universal Turing machine takes as its input tape another Turing machine. So it can perform what um, a, any Turing machine could do. And as I said, modern computers and computation is currently based on this. There are things that are not computable. We won't go into that now. These are philosophical questions, again, about what is computable and what isn't. But anything that you can do on a computer is computable. And that includes, as I said, your mobile phone. The second question that Turing was very interested in was about the nature of intelligence. And he 
proposed, he posed this question, can machines think? This was work after the war, in fact, shortly before his, his death. Um, and he wrote a paper called On Computing Machinery and Intelligence. This is, this is the paper, um, which was published in the journal called Mind in 1950. Um, it's actually a very accessible, very readable paper, and if you are interested in this stuff, I would recommend, you can Google it, it's, it's on... Um, it's on this website where that um, publishes work from Lubna Prize winners. And he's, I'll, I'll talk briefly about what this Turing test was. Um, it's an imitation game. And he first posed it as the question of, given a man and a woman and an interrogator, can the interrogator identify which is the man and which is the woman through just asking questions, without seeing them, without talking to them, but through a typed interface. And then he replaced it with the question of whether if you replace the woman with a computer, can an interrogator tell whether it is talking to a computer or a human? And if it can't, if the interrogator cannot tell, then that could, he, Turing claimed that that would be evidence that that machine had intelligence. Now we've moved on in what we think of as an intelligent machine since then. The question of whether something is intelligent because it appears to be intelligent or whether there is something deeper, these issues of strong artificial intelligence and weak artificial intelligence. But it was a really interesting and relevant thing. And I'm going to end with just a quick look at two um, A guy called Joseph Weissenbaum, just a bit more than a decade after Turing proposed this work, came up with this psychology robot. And this was how it interacted. And anyone want to state their problem? Please state your problem and I'll type it in. Okay. computer would respond. And this, Weissenbaum wrote this program as a, an embodiment of an artificial intelligence. And actually a lot of people at the time were very convinced and taken in by it. There's an anecdote that his secretary used to, when he was not in the office, she would lock the door and she would have psychotherapy with the robot. <laughs> There's another chatterbot where, again, you can type what you want to. And it will, it will respond. And next time when you're um, online and you get offered, when you're trying to buy something online, and you get offered a discussion with uh, someone online, think about whether that's actually a person or whether it's some computing technology. Um, and I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you.